Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Feigel. This is Talking Tax with Tom, Tom Yamachika of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. And we're going to talk about the intent to veto list, which is issued every year um, by the governor after the session is over. And by July 11th of this year, he will presumably do what he intended to do, what he said he intended to do. So Tom is here today to tell us about the veto practice, which is always very important. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me here, Jay. Okay, so we're here at this part in the year uh, where the session is is over, and now the governor has to do his thing. And uh, basically, the way it works under our constitution is that uh, on a certain date uh, after the end of the legislative session, this year it's June twenty third, the governor has to enter, uh, has to issue what's called an intent to veto list, and that is to give the legislature notice. Uh, that there may be vetoes coming down. So if they want to organize a, uh, a, a, you know, reorganize themselves and come back into session to, you know, go override some vetoes, that they can do that. Uh, and the the importance of it is that if a bill that has been passed and is, is before pending before the governor now, if it's not on the list, it's going to become law, either by signature or without signature. Uh, on or before July 11th, which is his final de final decision deadline. Well, what's in what's interesting about this is this is his first veto practice, right? He, That's right. This, this is the first governor? year he's governor, so this is his first his first round of vetoes. And we're, and seeing, it, we're, we're seeing what he's made of. It's very yep. instructive. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things is that there are no tax bills uh, on the veto list, so. Everything that we've been talking about, you know, in, in the course of the session uh, regarding, you know, taxes or lack thereof, uh, that's all going to be ir irrelevant. They're going to they're, they're they're all going to become law. Now, uh, that be said, um, there were like three hundred tax bills or so, and a very very few of them, like maybe a handful made it past the legislature. I mean, they had a, a very, uh, very chaotic, uh, what they call the cattle call uh, on the final day of conference committee. Um, and lots of things didn't, didn't, didn't go with and pass the hopper. It, it didn't, it, it, it ran the gauntlet, but didn't finish. So very, you know, very, a very small number of things passed. Well, we're, we're, you know, a lot of people have called this session a failure um, because bad, bad attitude, bad result, um, bad process. Uh, uh, they've been mean to each other or something. But what is it? What is it that, that people are thinking about this particular session? What characterizes it as opposed to other sessions? Well, um, that's very interesting that you said that because that, that's going to come to our first uh you know, topic of discussion today. Um, there, there were some issues that, when uh, when discussed, made for a lot of bad blood. Uh, one being the uh, first responder center in my in Waipahu or Bililani, somewhere around there. Um, it was a pet project of uh, you know the good senator from that district, uh, uh, who happens to be the chair of the Ways and Means Committee in the Senate. Um, he he wanted that project to go. Uh, the the first responders for whom it was intended didn't particularly like it. Uh, HPD, uh, in particular, said, "You know, we're not we're not buying it. We won't participate in it." And that and that gave um, the uh, you know the house some very uh, you know very very big pause there, and, and they and they basically killed the bill that uh, provided for the first responder center. But lo and behold, uh, in the budget reconciliation process, um, there was a legislative adjustment made and the project got funded anyway. Oh. And, for, and for good measure, mm -hmm. uh, there was a gentleman on the board of the High Tech Development Corporation, a gentleman named Vasilis Simos. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that that correct, uh, correctly, but uh, Simos. 
Sermos, yes. Uh, that bill would have booted him. So one of the things that happened in the intent to veto list is that governor uh, took a look at that appropriation and line item vetoed it. And he also is intending to veto House Bill 999, which is the one that um, that, that, that would boot Mr. Sermos. You know, there's been um, a fair amount of practice in Hawaii about special legislation. Legislation that does not affect, you know, the community in general, but that's uh, directed at, at helping or hindering some individual, some specific individual or corporation. And, you know, you talk about the, the bill to uh, to throw uh, the Silas Ceremos uh, off the HDDC board. That surely sounds to me like uh, it's vendetta legislation, but it's also unconstitutional because it's special legislation. And everybody knows it is. Isn't that remarkable that we still have such things so visible that for for everyone to see and know about special legislation? But this is a, a new kind of approach, and I'm disappointed that the legislature would generate a bill like that. What do you think about it? Well, I mean, if you if you take a look at uh, what seems to be going on, it's what what seems to be going on is is, is pretty deplorable. Um, that uh, you know, the legislature shouldn't be you know dealing in in you know petty grievances like that. Uh, in in my opinion. Well, let's um, talk about the uh, let's talk about the first responders center. We've we've discussed that before, you and me, and it's really extraordinary that the bill to create it, which was con you know controversial, um, failed. But then somebody stuck it in the budget. Who is the somebody? How could that happen? There's ways and means and. Senator De La Cruz, did they have that? Uh, did they do that? Uh, that's probably what happened because, uh, you know, the Senator, uh, along with uh, Finance Chair Kyle Yamashita on the House side, those are the, they're the primary negotiators of the budget. One thing that happened basically changed a whole lot, and that is the economy went south. Mm. So uh, we, uh, had a projection from Council on Revenues that was basically $1 billion less than we had before. Whoa. And so and so the governor calls up uh, the good senator, meets them over the weekend, and says, you know, Mr. Senator, I'm very sorry. Um, we don't have enough money to fund your project. So I'm going to line item it. And then, and then the, and the senator... Uh, I don't know what he was thinking at the time. Maybe he's plotting revenge. Uh, maybe he's, you know, uh, you know, going to get some, uh, you know, very large uh, folks from my, you know, my, my part of the woods and go to the governor's uh, office at, at, at some time when nobody's looking. Uh, but one thing that you have to understand is that the senator really couldn't do much at this point because. If, let's say, he were to, he were able to get the votes to override the governor's veto of the of that part of the budget, what's going to happen? Well, there's not going to be enough money to execute it, so the governor has district discretionary authority to restrict spending when there's no money. Fair enough. So so he can basically starve the project anyway. So overriding the overriding the the veto uh, would accomplish nothing, and I think I think the good senator knows that. Mm, but that that's so with every line line item veto, isn't it? Well, yeah. If if the economy goes south, if the economy goes north, then then that's a different story. Well, but you know, but I'm, since I'm we more... have less money to uh, to play around, uh, that's a very good argument for sustaining. Uh, any cuts that the governor's uh, going to make because you know you really can't do anything about it if you if you don't do anything and and a lot of governors just don't do anything and when uh, when it comes time to execute on the budget oh we don't have enough money for this so I'm going to restrict well a couple of things that really is surprising about the um, the economy changing direction that's another another issue maybe another show but 
Um, as I recall, this um, first responder center was going to cost hundreds of millions, right? This was not small change. Yeah, fifty million. Fifty million is what 50 the million. It, okay. it, that was the appropriation was. And it was controversial, as you said. Um, and and I wonder whether um, the Council on Revenues uh, reestimation uh, and um, you know the reestimation that maybe the economy is going down uh, is really just political cover, and that uh, the governor had uh, other policy reasons. And reasons, you know, that are rooted in lobbying and organizations that come and talk to him. The footnote to that is, uh, I don't know if this always happens, but it seems to me that it happens a lot. There's a parade of people that come after the session is over to lobby the governor about what he's going to veto. A parade. And just of course they there is. They lobby during the session, they lobby him after. And it's, you know, people spend their whole lives lobbying. Um, and so maybe in this case, uh, they were some persuasive lobbyists that convinced him to, to kill the bill or kill the project, um, whatever the financial condition of the state is. Well, that, that's possible. But uh, uh, if, if we weren't in such uh, a, a financial reversal type of situation, then Overriding the veto would would do something. Mm. You see, Never and and, I, and it couldn't it couldn't it wouldn't be an exercise in futility. I, I give him credit, and I'm interested in your opinion on this. I give him credit for you know being careful with our money. I give him credit for responding to the Council on Revenues. I give him credit for responding to at least some you know community interests that don't like this project, including HPD. Um, and all in all, you know, for whatever reason or whatever combination of reasons, I think it was the right thing for him to do. What do you think? Yeah, and, and, and I think um, the way he went about it was, was I think, uh, you know, very respectful, uh, very transparent. Again, what many governors would do is they wouldn't say anything. And, you know, as the year unfolds, you know, it would it would become apparent that, well, you know, uh, we've got a million dollar downturn, so something's got to give. This is one of them. I'm restricting this, you know, this, this, this funding. Well, just but, looking at but, that one, it seems like he's off on a good start as far as the veto practice is concerned. Right. So let's let's go. Let's go and uh, look at some of the other ones. On his on his budgetary veto list, mm -hmm. uh, by far the biggest item was uh, the rainy day fund. Uh, it, as as the budget passed, it would have contributed an extra billion dollars to the rainy day fund, five hundred million a year. Uh, you know, five hundred million in twenty twenty three, five hundred million in twenty twenty four. Okay, and the governor said, "Well, we don't have that surp that huge surplus anymore." So he knocked off half. Oh, I didn't know that the governor could do um, a fractional uh, line item veto. That's interesting. Yeah, well, there, there were there were two appropriations, one for each year. You see, mm, so okay. so he so he could just line out line out one year. That's okay. what he did. Mm -hmm. So okay, that's that's a lot of bread, and of course it's a special fund, and so it it's questionable fiscal policy. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? Well, um, I mean, there, there are people who may disagree with me on this, but uh, I am very wary about you know, keeping too much money uh, in a special fund, uh, especially if it doesn't do anything in, in, you know, in, the, in real time. Because, you know, we're just keeping it there for a rainy day, right? So almost by definition, it's going to, it's not going to do anything. And we have current needs here in the state. We've got, we've got infrastructure uh, that needs building. We have like toilets at the airport that need repair. Uh, we need like showers fixed at the university. Um, lots of educational facilities at the school level. All of that, uh, you know, all of those are current needs. And, and we can't simply defer maintenance forever. 
which is what we had been doing. Can I add a thought to what you said? And it's this, you know, there's a storm out there with our name on it. There's climate change, extreme weather coming our way. Who knows what kind of natural disaster we may experience. <clears throat> and we are not really hardened. We are not really resilient. Um, we need to spend more money on becoming resilient. But when you put it in a rainy day fund, it's like amorphous. There's, there's no label on it. There's no particular project on it. It's, I guess yeah. it's discretionary, but you don't, you don't harden your systems. You don't improve your infrastructure. You don't build resilience with it. It sits there and you are not resilient for the real rainy day. That's right. Um, and it's for that reason that a number of departments have other uh, slush funds like we talked about before, uh, like the Hawaii Hurricane Relief Fund, which has $187 million. Um, even though the, you know, the, the machinery on the fund has been defunct uh, since the early 2000s. Now, uh, if it made sense to have the money there and to have the machinery cranked up and ready to go, because you know the the storm with our name on it is coming this way at some point, I mean then that's fine. That's a policy decision that can be made. But but if if you're going to basically wind everything down, which they have, then you know why keep slush funds in you know many different places? The only you know thing that you're doing is uh, hiding the money. Yes, and then when and then when you do have a bad day, or a rainy day, or a storm with our name on it, uh, it's it's too late. It's too late to to build resilience after the fact. And if you're not resilient to start with, uh, the damage is greater, and the cost of repairing it is greater. So it's really backward planning or upside down planning. That's that's my reaction to it. Yeah. Uh, now. Um... We, we talked a little bit about the Hurricane Relief Fund before. It was actually used, um, it, it, you know, when the when the Great Recession hit uh, to, to kind of like, um, or, or maybe a little bit before that to to kind of pay, pay some teachers instead of, you know, furlough Fridaying them. Uh, and then, it, but, but it was accompanied by a, a, a charge on the GET to pay it back. Um, whereas, I mean, the, the same thing probably could have been accomplished by uh, not involving the fund. I mean, why, 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 why involve the Hurricane Relief Fund if you're going to just uh, you know, divert money from the GET anyway? I mean, why don't you just divert the money and have that pay for what you need? Yeah, try to explain that all this fancy bookkeeping to the guy on the street, or the woman on the street, and it they're not going to understand or appreciate it, uh, and I don't. Um, anyway, let's talk about the procurement exemptions for the Department of Education. What happened there? Is that on the veto list? Yep, uh, that, that one is Senate Bill 1518. Uh, the bill gives the Department of Education several procurement exemptions. Okay, why? According to the bill's preamble, the DOE, the DOE is basically a big hog, big honking department and doesn't have time to be bogged down with such silly things as procurement laws. <laughs> but hey, everybody else has to follow those laws. So, so why the heck are you so special? Well, I mean, I'm... if, if, if they had, um, you know, more transparency in their budget, which, which, you know, some other organizations have been fighting for for years. Uh, we, you know, we wouldn't have to uh, worry about stuff like this, but but they're, but they're so large. Um, their their budget detail is not detail; it's not granular at all. Uh, the bill says it, it, the the state's electronic procurement system is so complicated and onerous it places a heavy burden on school administrators who need to comply with the law. Well, everybody else does. So, 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 what, what, what makes you so special to be exempt from it? So, so that's why, that's why it's on the governor's list, and, and I think that's a good thing. I, I agree with you. 
Let me let me add though that the uh, Department of Education is a huge um, allocation of funds. Huge. What are they? They must get many billions to run DOE, huh? Oh yes, of course. And it's all islands, and it's uh, not you know, it's like unlike any other state. But let me let me uh, let me add this thought though. You know, I was on the High Tech Development Corporation years ago. This was twenty years ago. And uh, it, it was it was like the bane of our existence that the procurement code was such a royal pain. It was humbug about everything, and it, it required us to uh, create uh, you know bureaucracy and to uh, continue bureaucracy and to just do business. And I don't think HDDC was alone in this regard. Uh, everybody everybody felt that the procurement code ought to be. Uh, fixed. Um, I like the Sunshine Law. No, that's another one that's locked in amber. And anyway, um, what I get out of this is that the DOE thought that that it, they should get an exemption because they're special, and the rest of those slobs out there will have to continue to deal with the humbug um, and unmodified, unreformed procurement law, which nobody likes. And so I, I, I feel that if, if you're going to try that, how about reforming the procurement code for everybody? Yeah, that's what you got to do. I mean, if, if the procurement code ain't working, you fix it. Don't, right. don't, don't say, oh, yeah, this department is special. It's the fair-haired child. So, so he can do other things that nobody else can. No, that's, that's not the way you do it. I agree totally. Well, good, good for Josh Green that he's not going to allow that to happen. Another, another, you know, point for him on this on this year's veto practice. Um, but let's go to um, the artwork part. You know, you told me before the show that that was more uh, amusement than policy. But uh, what is happening with our artwork collection? We well, have a huge artwork collection. Yes, we do. We have a uh, a, a very large uh, artwork. A collection that we own at the at the state level, and so somebody got the idea of well let's let's monetize it, um, and 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 we've accumulated all this artwork because there's actually a set aside in the budget uh, for a certain percentage of the budget to be used for artwork. Now uh, somebody had the bright idea. Okay, well, um, we have all this art sitting around here. Why don't we why don't we make it work for us? So the bill says, all right. Uh, let's loan out the art to private individuals, businesses, or entities for reasonable financial consideration. That way we make the art available for a lot more people to enjoy and the state gets some money. Win-win situation, right? Well, you know, well, the governor doesn't think so. His veto rationale is that property bought with taxpayer funds, which it is, has to be used only for a public purpose. And, um, you know, lending it out to private entities is is not a public purpose. It's just, it's just money grubbing. <laughs> uh, um, well, there there is a, you know, a, a, a bit of a tradition on this. I, I don't know whether it's happened in recent years, but I do remember the State Foundation um, giving art to businesses downtown and letting them hang it in their offices. But I tell you, I always felt a little uncomfortable about that <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One is that, um, is is that it, yes, it is it is state property. Uh, uh, what are you doing? And is it uh, is it really a, a an arm's length transaction that they would pay a very modest rental for these paintings and the like? Uh, the other is uh, what happens if they lose them or somebody takes them one fine night. Uh, what then? They're gonna we're gonna make up for it. And the third problem is is that um, there's plenty of room for abuse, isn't there? When you start mm. renting valuable art to your friends and relatives, um, so I I agree with him. I would veto that bill also. Um, not to say that the the museum is the great shakes. Uh, the museum is supposed to show and rotate this art is no big deal. And uh, we could use a much better museum, um, and that's how we could show it. Yeah. Now, um, the the uh, the thing that doesn't sit well with me though is is that um, 
If, if they're th thinking uh, that this program could get the state into, you know, federal tax trouble, like compromising the state's tax exempt bond program or, um, uh, or, or, or getting, you know, people's exemptions uh, scotched, um, somebody ought to, have, ought to have testified about this during session and nobody did. Mm. So well, what do you think? As a matter of law, I don't, I don't think that uh, jeopardizes the, the state's uh, exemption or ability to uh, operate in any way. It's just a, a small thing. Uh, it doesn't have any tax import, does it? Well, the, the um, uh, you know, the argument is, is that, uh, you know, if you, you make this available to private people and you're borrowing money, then, uh, then you violated your bond covenants. You can't borrow for private purposes. Mm. Okay. I, I just, my gut on it is that this is such small potatoes. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really not going to get in the way. Yeah. Uh, it, it just, it just seems, you know, kind of, you know, kind of small, but, you know, who knows? Anyway, well, that, that's, that's kind of that program. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about, uh, Special purpose digital currency licensure. Yes, let's do that. Very important. Okay, Senate Bill nine four five would have would have Hawaii start to regulate cryptocurrency, um, but the uh, the eighty plus page bill contains a lot of words, but no money uh, for DCC to to DCCA to turn those words into action. So, um, uh, it can't go anywhere then. Can't really go anywhere. Yeah. Well, this all it all seems to reinforce uh, the notion that the legislature didn't do a whole lot this year. Uh, we had plenty of noise about corruption and bullying. Um, we heard, you know, strange um, experiences in the legislature and and fights and vendetta, vendettas and all that. But we didn't see a whole lot of good policy come out of it. And, you know, and, and Josh Green has been around. He's been around the block. He was um, a kind of a stiff-necked legislator himself. He didn't, he didn't uh, actually fall in line when he was in the Senate. He was exercising independent judgment. And he certainly is doing that now. And maybe this is really a, a breath of fresh air that he put these things on the list. And each one of the things that you and I have talked about, I mean, I don't think it's accidental, uh, has good policy to it. So he's making at least, you know, at least to that extent, good veto decisions in his first year. I give him credit. I mean, who knows what else he's doing and whether we would approve of that too. But on this, on this veto list, it sounds like he's doing the right thing. What do you think? Yeah, well, it's certainly, it's certainly a promising start. And uh, of course, uh, we're one year into a four-year term, so uh, there's there's plenty of time left. We'll see how that plays out. Um, and it's unfortunate that you know one of his uh, initiatives to you know give significant reform in the tax system kind of kind of hit hit a wall in the legislature and didn't go anywhere. Uh, but but maybe that'll uh, gain a little bit more momentum next session. Did you like that, Bill? It wasn't bad, yeah. It wasn't bad. It's a, something that we needed for you know many years, but I give him credit that. for that too. Okay, you know he's going to run into a, a snag when the legislature is intransigent, um, but at least he tried. He came mm -hmm. up with something. Uh, I'm not sure he can get things through the the crowd that that controls the legislature, but at least he tried. And I, I agree with you. He 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 probably will should. Uh, put that bill in again. You should keep on on going. I think what you know what he really needs to do is uh, is what uh, Blanchiardi does at the city level. He needs to connect with with the community. We need to hear from him. Uh, maybe he should come down on think tech. Um, yeah, and, yeah. He needs to he needs to use his bully pulpit. Yeah, and uh, and and get the you know get the public riled up and uh, and let let the uh, legislature know. Uh, you know, from the community, what they want, what they need, and you know, if the, the community is engaged, the legislature will do different things. 
Absolutely. But they were not going to be engaged if you don't talk to them. That's right. You know, I think it's very interesting that he makes the uh, the, the veto uh, list, the intent to veto list, and he calls um, the legislators who he's, you know, he's going to veto the bills that they were championing. Um, and he talks to them and he's very transparent and respectful of them and all that. But what about me? I want to hear from him. I, I want to hear exactly what he says to them. I want to know, I want to hear his policy reasons for all of the vetoes. And it wouldn't, wouldn't be hard. And guys like you and me, we would support him in that because he does have good policy behind these vetoes. Um, I, I really think he's missing the boat on trying to explain it beyond the members of the legislature who are pushing him. It should be more than lobbying. It should be informing the public so the public can have confidence. All about confidence, right? Yeah, and I think he's 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 starting to do that. I mean, that the, the I think the press needs to, uh, you know, trust him more and 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 maybe give him a bit, a bit more of a microphone. Yeah, I agree. But I think in general, if you want to look over what he's done in the past six months uh, since he took office, this is this is a good sign. This is a good sign that he's uh, is being independent about it, and uh, he's calling a spade a spade, and he's not he, not allowing himself to be pushed around. I, and I can only see that when when he when he gets the lay of the land and appreciates it all the more, exactly what he can do and not um, next year, for example, uh, he'll be even better at it. And we can expect then. I mean, this is, I'm, maybe I'm talking too soon and out of school. But from this indication, we can expect a good administration. I certainly, I certainly hope so, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, well, so uh, you think there's any surprises between now and July 11th? Uh, I, I don't see any right now, but uh, you know, the legislature is full of surprises. So we'll see what happens with them. Is there any other indication there might be a special a special session? Not so far, but. Again, you never know. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right, Tom. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your help, your help today. Thank you for having me on the show. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.